This is Vivian Howard from Chef and the Farmer in Kempston, North Carolina, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to a very special edition of U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy own, create, dream about, preserve, love, hate, and even write about modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm George Smart. Way back in 2007, one dark and stormy night, usmodernist.org started off as Triangle Modernist Houses, a list on a legal pad that 18 months later became an award-winning website tracking modernist architecture in the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area of North Carolina. Now there's a new book by architect Victoria Bell that dives down even deeper with profiles on classic mid-century architects including Harwell Hamilton Harris, Leif Valland, Milton Small, George Matsumoto, Eduardo Catalano, and Brian Shawcroft, plus current modernist architects including Kenneth Hobgood, Phil Shostak, Phil Freelon, Teron Duda, Ellen Cassidy, Ellen Weinstein, and our own Frank Harmon who wrote the foreword. It's an outstanding history of triangle architecture. And then there's some dude I've never heard of who wrote the epilogue. (laughs) The book is Triangle Modernist Architecture, sponsored by Oro Editions, available at your local bookstore or, if you'd like to support our nonprofit's mission, at ncmodernist.org slash triangle. And I'm Tom Guild, still getting used to the role reversal here. But George did speak earlier this fall with Victoria Bell and her husband, Brian, via Zoom from their home in Raleigh, North Carolina. Victoria is the author of the book, Materials for Design, and the sequel to the book, Materials for Design 2, and the recent sequel to the book, Materials for Design, the musical, featuring the great hit, Don't Cry for Me, Custom Concrete. Welcome, Victoria. Hello. Thank you, George. How are you? Good. Thank you. I can't wait to see the musical version. Right? Me too. Yeah. It's, it's, I hear it's going to be awesome. Yeah. So um, who is this guy uh, sitting beside you? This is Brian Bell, my husband, who is an associate professor at NC State, and he teaches public interest design, which is an emerging field in the field of architecture. And he's also my biggest cheerleader. He is also the professor of a class called um, Triangle Modern Architecture at NC State, which a lot of graduate students take and has been a great um, wealth of information that has helped me build this book that I've written. So uh, did you you two meet through architecture or was it some other context? We did. Um, I was a graduate student at uh, the University of Virginia, and I had the great fortune of having Sam Mockby, Sambo Mockby. If, oh, sure. So if y'all know who he is, I had him as a professor for one semester. He was a visiting professor at Virginia, and Brian worked for Sambo, and he also was a visitor critique on our studio. So he was critiquing me as a graduate student and architecture. And we didn't start dating until after I graduated. So there was no sort of like weird things like that. But um, that's where I first met him. And, and it's been, you know, one great ride ever since. I, well, exactly. Exactly. And two great kids. <laughs> and you've been in this area for what, about 20 years? 20 years. We moved here in 2000. Right after we got married, we chose to move to the Triangle very consciously. And <laughs> not that I had a job and not that Brian really had a job, but we really want, loved the area and wanted to build a family here. I noticed that on the cover of your book is a house by Kenneth Hobgood, and you worked with him at one point. Yes. So that was my first job when I moved here, and I love Kenneth. And I love the Hobgood family, and they were just, it was the best architecture office experience ever, and um, I'm just the biggest fan, and he was the best boss and the best teacher, and yeah, I worked there for a couple of years before I started having babies, and uh, I just learned so much from Kenneth, and so I felt a great loyalty towards Kenneth, and that's why he's on the front cover of my book. It's a beautiful house. Yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want to live there, right? Yeah, I, right. And this area is full of beautiful houses. In fact, you've tracked down quite a few of them. 
Yes. Well, only thanks to you, George, because thanks to you, I mean, who have documented so many of them, I've been able to accumulate some of them for this book, just some of them. I mean, your website has all of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got some really great ones and you've highlighted them in a way and in a, in a detail that we don't do on the website. Um, well, I selected for my book um, 18 architects from the mid-century from two generations and then 18 from our current professionals that I feel that have carried some of those same design principles to our current day. And I wanted to, I don't feel like it's a comprehensive representation of anybody of, of all of those architects work, but at least I tried to pull their best work and their sort of high points in their career. And so I, I hesitate to say that it's comprehensive about any architect in the book that I've written, but I hope that I've tried to hit the high points of what they've built and designed. There are so many great architects that came out of NC State, which is one of the reasons we have so many great houses around here. How did NC State come into prominence as a center for modernism? Very good question. And you'll have to read my book because it's a great <laughs> story, which I know you know, George, but it really starts with Henry Camp Hefner, and he's the main character. And he was the dean of the architecture school during the mid-century. And he was, I don't want to use an iron fist, but he had high standards and he really revamped the whole architecture school in the 19, starting in 1948 when he came to Raleigh and he had some very strict parameters about him coming here to create this new school. He wanted to hire who he wanted to hire and he wanted to fire who he wanted to fire and he wanted a new building and he had a design standard that every student had to live up to. And with that discipline and rigor, I think he developed um, internationally uh, known high design school. So Camp Hefner is really the, the, he is the main character of the story. And without him, I don't think any of this would have existed. By 1950, a Frank Lloyd Wright had come to visit the school. That's right. So he attracted all these great designers. I mean, he attracted people from the Black Mountain College, which, as you know, like Joseph Albers, Rauschenberg, all these great artists. For he came here. I mean, so many of these great designers were attracted to NC State only because of Camp Hefner's rigor and desire to really put the school at a national and international level. I like to trace the the roots of our school or of NC State back to the Bauhaus, and as the Bauhaus was shutting down in 1933 and Hitler was rising, a lot of these great designers, um, proponents of modernism, came to Raleigh, came to Black Mountain College and tried to find their own voice there. And what a great location for Camp Hefner to pull from, you know, from the Black Mountain College. So it was almost like the stars all aligned for NC State. And I don't think a lot of people know this story. It's such a great story to tell. And that's why I wrote this book, because I think that, you know, to think about such a monumental time in history for design that nobody really knows about, that you can trace modernism back to Bauhaus right here in Raleigh. How long was Camp Hefner the dean at the school, approximately? Oh, gosh, until 1973. Okay, yeah. Long so, time. You know, 25 long years. time. Um, Kenneth Hopgood. Yeah, so a lot of people that we know that are around today have met him and knew him as the dean. And yeah, he was a long reigning dean. Huge impact. I remember going to his house. Oh, so you when know I was him. eight years old. So what were your memories? I don't remember much. Right. I just, you know, being squired around by my dad, going to different places. You know, when you're right. eight, you have no clue what's happening. No, but at least you can say that you were in his presence, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or what that's worth. Right. He did some things that professors, I guess, don't do as much today. I'll have to check this out with Brian. Like, um, for instance, he could pretty much hire or fire anybody he wanted to without a committee, right? Right, right. Like, Which they don't let you do anymore. You've got to have just, interviews think, and HR getting involved and all that kind of thing. Right. And he also had a lot of people over to his house. He would have seminars at his house constantly, which I guess you guys probably don't do at your house. No, but wouldn't that be fun? I mean, that <laughs> I've seen the photos of him, you know, in this great modern house. And yeah, I mean, it was a it was a different time, right? And it was a, it was a different era. And I think it was an exciting time because I think every, all those people thought that 
they were doing cutting, well, they were doing cutting edge work at a, in a cutting edge time. And um, it is a pretty interesting time to be in Raleigh. Not only did he hire people, but he also was the entire admissions committee. Apparently he would interview every single student yeah. coming in, which is incredible to think about now. And uh, yeah, he really had a vision for the school and very sort of holistic approach to it. One of the things that he encouraged the time for a couple of decades was for faculty and students to be active practitioners yes. in doing houses, particularly for their friends and family and themselves. Right. And, and how did that contribute to some of the houses and architects that you profiled? Right. So that was one of the proponents that if you, if you are going to be a professor at NC State, you have to also practice architecture and you have to be building these houses. And I think absolutely that was one of the reasons why Raleigh was put on the national mark of modern design, because these professors who were academic, they were scholars, they were also building things and building things in such a way that were innovative and creative and not like anything that had been built before. And it was also amazing time for new ideas. I mean, this was after World War II, a lot of veterans were returning home looking for a family, but also wanting something new, not tied to the past. And Raleigh was growing. Uh, Research Triangle Park was coming along. People were coming in to work at IBM. So it was a real influx of new people, new ideas, real growth. One of the great things about our book, there's this postcard of Raleigh in 1945, which is unbelievable because you can tell what a small town it was just at that point of exploding with new ideas and new people and technology and innovation and, and creativity. In 1954, most people in the planet only knew of two houses in North Carolina. One was Biltmore, and the second one was something called the Catalano House in Raleigh. Tell us about that. Yes, right? So the Catalano House was right here by NC State, and Eduardo Catalano who was one of Camp Hefner's hires, did this amazing, I think somebody calls it the potato chip roof house, which is an engineering wonder. It's, it's not just only beautiful and innovative, but it was an engineering wonder with pre-stressed concrete and a roof like we've never seen before. And it made the New York Times, it made House and Garden and Architecture Record, it made national news. And I think you're right, that probably put us on the map of you know, high design, like Raleigh is a cutting edge city for high design, modernism, progressive thought. It was, it was the house. And it's such a shame that it's not still around, but that was, that was it, that house. There are a couple of things, you know, about that house, although that house isn't replicated, there's some ideas behind the house that are uniquely Raleigh. I mean, there are not many sites in cities where you can build and have such privacy and beautiful nature around you. But that that is such a feature of Raleigh that you can be on a, a city on street and have a beautiful lot with interesting topography, beautiful trees, and have privacy. And, and not be a, an estate in New Canaan. This is a affordable lot in Raleigh. So that was such an opportunity. And also because of our wonderful climate, just the relationship between indoor and outdoor that he expressed so well in that house is one of the great features that you know architects today appreciate. I mean, we can sit outside and enjoy this climate even today in August, which is amazing. I mean, it's, you know, this is a wonderful place to live and enjoy the outdoors. And, and so there's a lot of deep ideas to that house besides the form that really continue in our current talent and current buildings. Which came first? Was it Brian's class on triangle architecture or your book? Well, I think it was my book and I kind of really wanted that information from our current professionals. And he, he's an art history major from Princeton. So he, he loves the idea of accumulating ideas about your current cultural, social situation and kind of interpreting them in an architectural way. So he is highly skilled to teach this class. And I felt like everything that he taught, I could definitely 
use in this book. And we were able to call in a lot of the current professionals and interview them and film them. And I mean, I feel like it was, it's a monumental class just because we will have this record for years, but also we got such a personal side to all these current professionals that we will have for generations. And I hope that I've expressed all that in the, in the book. What were you going to say? No, it's Victoria's idea, but she made me realize that we had a real except for you and your work, George, and your incredible documentation, which has been an inspiration for so many people, including us. I mean, this wouldn't have happened without you yeah. and your early support and your resources on your website and your you come and speak in the class. You're very inspiring to everybody. But we realized there was just this vacuum of information. And I, I would sort of hear these stories in the hallways of NC State about these amazing architects. But it, I'm like, who, what? When, when, what? And these these stories were just not known until you came along, but we still have a long way to go to tell these wonderful stories. And so there's a couple of moments when I just thought we really need to have our students understand this better. So one of our professors describes NC State as a well-kept secret. Well, that's great, <laughs> but it's not so great for you know, our recruiting or our students getting hired, everybody who hires our students know they're incredible, but you don't want to be a well-kept secret. And another story is one of our professors told a student that he was nominated for the Camp Hefner Prize, and he said, who's Camp Hefner? Uh -huh. You know, this is just tragic. Our students are still influenced by the principles and the founding ideas of the school, and they need to be self-aware and to be fulfilled designers and have their own voice. They need to know who's influencing them. So so I teach this seminar and yeah, it's been a real pleasure to, to interview people. We've interviewed some people that are no longer with us, which is mm. tragic. You know, you don't even see this coming, but we've lost uh, Phil Freelon and Steve Schuster, but we have this wonderful in interviews with them and they're wonderfully featured in the book. And uh, this information is lost, except for people like you and the NC State Library Archives that you know, there's wonderful first-hand information. So the students get to go to the archives and look at original pencil on vellum drawings by these amazing architects. And they use your website and do research. And their final assignment is like, well, who are you as an architect? Who influenced you? What are your design principles? And instead of writing about other people all the way through their education, they actually have this moment where they say, who am I as a designer, but also acknowledge People like Camp Hefner and Catalano and Novitsky and Phil Shostak and Kenneth Hobgood to realize, you know, who they appreciate and how they became who they are. And I think that's a really important moment for our students to, to reach. Victoria, were there any architects that you really hadn't heard of before that you were surprised to discover during this process? There were probably too many that I had not heard of that were so incredibly talented that I wanted to include in the book, but I didn't have the space. So yes, and that's the tragic story is that there are so many that aren't included mid-century and current professionals. But yes, I mean, I learned a lot myself as an architect writing this book. There were plenty that you had. I mean, I have to say, George, I just want to thank you also for the support because I think I wouldn't been able to write this book without your help and your support and your initial grant that you gave us. I mean, there's so much information that I would never have had access to and privy to without your support and your energy. And so, yeah, there was a lot that I didn't know. And it was, and you think that's what kept me going over five years is that I was learning stuff, you know, every day about these really interesting people. And as a licensed architect myself, so much respect for so many of these people. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the main points of this book, George, just like what you do is to bring the ideas and principles of modernism to the public, because there are things we talk about at school that we don't really share very well. And that's tragic because the cultural treasure we have here between the talent and 73 years of buildings is incredible. One of the things incredible about it is, is there's continuous thread all the way back to the Bauhaus. I mean, some areas might adopt modernism because it's popular, but we have this cultural continuity that we should be so proud of. 
you know, having gone to schools that jump on every trend every year, it's, it's incredible that we've had this consistency and this cultural appreciation of what is modern. Now, let me, let me just say that one of the things we learned in interviewing the architects was they didn't want to be called modernists. The original name of the seminar was Triangle Modernism. And they said, well, I'm not a modernist. I am influenced by the by modern architects and they're my inspiration, but we've evolved since then. And that's what's really fascinating is to see how each generation has evolved since the early modernists. And the, the main way we've evolved, our, our community here has evolved is influence of the local, the contextual, the regional. And it's not sort of blank slate. If you think of Villa Savoie, that sort of like on a blank slate, it's our favorite projects, but it, it's a blank slate. It has no context. And this is such an amazing place. It's one of the reasons we moved here is the topography, the culture, the vernacular architecture here is so rich that you want to appreciate that. And, and our current architects do. And that's why I enjoy asking students, well, what do you believe in? You know, so to see these principles. So, so really I'd say the book is about what are the principles? This is not about a style. It's not about form. It's not about corrugated metal. It's about these principles that have been developing since early modernism. And if you take an idea like uh, innovation and technology, certainly something very important at NC State, those are modernist principles. But then if you take a principle like sustainability, well, that's something very current and endorsed by the current generation. But if you listen to Frank Harmon talk about what is the wisdom of farmers and mechanics, that is sustainable. They used materials effectively. Materiality is this modern concept Victorian Fat Rand have written about. They are minimalist, you know, they are efficient, they are form follows function. So some of these ideas that we think of as modern, we can trace back 200 years in North Carolina. So there's this wonderful thread, not just of modernism, but of, of what we appreciate regional. And anybody who's heard Frank Harmon talk about appreciating the stream behind his house and appreciating tobacco barns and appreciating how farmers design things, you really know that there's really this regional influence. It's not just about being modern, but uh, it's a wonderful combination. Victoria, tell us about some of the architecture in your book that, that went on to national prominence, not just regional here. Well, we know Hill Freelon and the National Mall in D.C. is That was probably the feather in his cap. The National African American Museum, the Smithsonian Museum, and that has gotten international acclaim. Phil Freelon is just amazingly talented. I, I got to say, George, we come here and we see Kenneth Hobgood. And we look at Kenneth Hobgood and we say, this guy is the best there is. He really is. But he's not, <laughs> he's not as well known as he should be. That's the, this is the tragedy. I mean, and I have to say, I mean, one of the things we love about this community is the humble quality. And nobody's more humble than Kenneth Hobgood. And he thinks he's not talented, which is ridiculous. He thinks he only can achieve his, if you read his interview in the book, it's like, I got to work hard because I'm not talented. It's so ridiculous. I mean, the guy is, the guy is talented as Corbusier. I mean, unbelievable. And, uh, but he's so modest. Yes. So it's a wonderful combination. But unfortunately, people who should be well-known are so modest. And, and really, I know Victoria and I, we hope this book is a tribute to these amazing talents that we have. And we hope that our local community appreciates it even more than the work you do, George, because when we have one of these great commissions, we shouldn't be hiring outside people. We have, we have the best talent there is right here. You mean commissions for new buildings yeah. yes. around the area? Yes. It's frustrating yes. when we hear about you know, oh, they hired somebody from Manhattan or from LA to design something in Raleigh or in Chapel Hill or Durham. You know, we have international acclaimed architects here. We can have the talent here. So, and I know that's a that's a big issue with a lot of the current professionals, but maybe that will change. You've been working on this book about five years? Correct, yeah. I assume that's a lot longer than it took you to do the materiality books. Um, I mean, this has been quite an ongoing process. Well, so the first materiality redesign book, I think, took me seven years. Oh, really? Because I, okay. I had my first child, and, you know, I was working. I was working full-time. And then the 
second book, I pulled in Pat Rand a little bit earlier and he really helped me maybe three or four years. And then, you know, I like to take my time, George. <laughs> What's the hardest part about doing a book like this? I think staying with, sticking with it. I think mm. that's the hardest part because there's so many days where you're like, oh, it's just when you see how much there is to do, I want to throw in the towel. So the hardest part is just saying every day, nope, just do a little bit. Like Brian's really good at telling me, just do a little bit and celebrate it just, you know, every day. Because if you can get so overwhelmed when you're writing a book, because there's just so much, there's the footnotes, there's the credits, there's the grammar side of it. Oh no, you, you have to go back and edit that 10 times. It's, you know, writing a book is, um, it's like creating a baby. It's just, it's a lot. It takes longer though. Yeah. <laughs> it takes longer. Much Why longer. is it only nine months? It should yeah. be nine months. <laughs> it's just a lot. And every time I wrote a book, I mean, I always say, that's it. I'm not doing it again. But, but George, the final phase, which was getting permission to use a lot of these beautiful images oh, was that. credit. Hate yeah, but we couldn't have done it without you, George, because you knew who to talk to, who was the heir or the son or the sister or so-and-so of, you know. Yeah, I, I got the mistresses. I got the cousins. I got right? them all. And, and I'd call him up and he'd be like, oh, let me just send you that phone number. And he would have phone numbers from people that sometimes I'm sorry they were dead, but like he had phone numbers. Yeah, George. George did. I mean, he had a phone number for everybody, but some of yeah. them were not around anymore. But so it was so resourceful. That's one of the nice things. I think, you know, your your website has everything on it. But to be able to put this together in 220 color pages, high resolution, took a lot of permissions and a lot of access to the archives. And, you know, it really is, I think one of the nice things about it is people who are not the most devoted students of our local architecture, you know, it's a really good introduction to why this is such a value we have here and the story behind it. Where can people buy this book? So they can buy it on Oro's website, O-R-O, -O, my publisher. They can buy it on Amazon. They can buy it from George through your website. You can buy it through local, hopefully local bookstores. We're working on that. That's just one more component, right? It's a bit of a challenge right now to have a I, book signing in uh, bookstores right now. True. Yeah. Yes. I mean, let's just hope that people buy it through your website. Yeah, and I believe some of that uh, supports your cause, which we're so happy to do. You stepped up like on day one. I mean, it's very wonderful and supportive. Thank you both for this. I'm really happy that you've done this. It's a great gift to the community and to the world to share what we have in the Triangle, both historically and currently. And there's a lot of beautiful uh, photography in there of the houses. There's photographs of the original sketches like you were showing me a moment ago. And some great stories about not only the development of architecture in the Triangle, but the individual practitioners. Thank you. I just wish it could be like 10 times longer because there's just, just really the tip of the iceberg. There's just so many people that aren't included. So maybe volume two, but... Right. Well, Triangle Architecture, the musical, could be coming next. That's right. Well, I'm working on that <laughs> on the weekend, <laughs> my free time. All the right. Next five-year project. <laughs> right. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, George, for everything. The book is Triangle Modern Architecture, published by Oro Editions, and you've been listening to George Smart talking with Victoria and Brian Bell. More information on the architects you heard about can be found by last name, generally, at our North Carolina site, ncmodernist.org. For example, if you're looking for Brian Shawcroft, go to ncmodernist.org slash Shawcroft. The book is available at your favorite local bookstore or if you'd like to support our nonprofit's mission at ncmodernist.org slash triangle. Thanks for listening. Okay, George, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Tom Guile at Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. The door code is 867-5309, what? What? in case you want to visit. <laughs> Our theme song was performed by me, George Smart, and Robinson Earl. You have to change that. Carrie Chesarina researches guests while juggling two above-average children, a flaming sword, a bowling ball, and a lemon drop martini. U.S. Marnish Radio is a production of Marnish Archive, a nonprofit educational archive 
for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. Tom and I will be back soon with another Design is Always Local edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. 